and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to December 1984 to get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games, we compare Scramble clones in our arcade shootout, we review some older games, we take a look at some newer games, and we pay another visit to Type In Corner. But first, it's back to the time machine in December 1984. Sinclair's newly designed Spectrum, the Spectrum Plus, has run into reliability issues and the number of replacements needed has caused a shortage of the computer. High street retailers like Boots and WH Smith are saying it's going to be a real problem, especially around the Christmas period. The problems lie with the new QL style keyboard, with many machines having loose keys, but Sinclair, in reply, said that the situation is not as bad as people are making out. A wax model of Clive Sinclair will be added to the collection at Madame Tussauds in London next April. The model is actually complete, but will not go on display until, strangely enough, a model of Selina Scott is ready, as the two will appear together. A promised price drop by Sinclair for its microdrive cartridges now looks set not to happen. The price was due to come down to just 4 95 each, but Sinclair are now saying this won't happen. The new electric car, designed by Sinclair, is due to go on sale in January for around £400. The car is said to suit short journeys or commuting or leisure activities and has a top speed of 15 miles per hour. Being just 6.5 foot long and having a range of only 24 miles, you better make sure you know where your nearest plug socket is. DKtronics have announced their new speech unit, giving your Spectrum infinite speech capabilities. Built around the SLO256 chip, the device will cost $24.95 and come with its own speaker. And that's the news, and now onto the top selling games. Coming into the charts this month are Booty from Firebird. Jim the Cabin Boy goes in search of booty in this pirate platform game. Fall Guy from Elite, a game based on the TV series. School Days from Microsphere, just to remind the kids that it won't be long before the holiday ends and they're back at school. Cyclone from Vortex, a great 3D helicopter rescue game. And Pajama Armor from Microgen, a nice looking arcade adventure starring Wally Week. And that was the news and top selling games from December 1984. Scramble was released in the arcade in 1981 by Konami, although the game itself was developed by Stern. It boasted being the first horizontal shooter with forced sideways movement, in that the landscape scrolls regardless of whether you move or not. It also had distinct levels with changing alien attack waves and different strategies, not to mention the ever decreasing fuel, replenished only by destroying fuel pods. There's a lot going on here for the Spectrum to copy, not only the scrolling but multi-directional movement, missiles and bombs and some of the most iconic sounds ever to come out from an arcade cab. Not to mention the range of different landscapes and obstacles. So let's take a look and see how it got on. The first game is Avenger, from Abacus Programs, released in 1982. Being a very early release, it's no surprise that the game is far from arcade perfect. The landscape judders across the screen, and the ship is limited to just up and down movements, there's no left or right. You have a laser and bombs of course, but if you use the laser too much, it will overheat and revert to only firing slowly. Ground-based enemies fire projectiles at you that can only be destroyed by using your bombs. Your laser is useless on them. The best plan I found was to just keep bombing, in the hope that I would destroy them before they destroyed me. The laser can be used to kill airborne enemies, and these also fire missiles back, sometimes making for a very busy screen. There is no fuel replenishment in this game, which I suppose is a good thing, considering all the rest of the things that are on screen. Your ship has five shields, which can take hits from anything except the landscape, and once strained, you lose a ship. The graphics are very basic, as you can see, and moving character-based jumps. The sound too is also limited, with just two effects, one for the laser, and one for when something is destroyed. 
If you do manage to get far enough into the game, for some reason a huge nuclear explosion erupts and destroys your ship. I had no idea why until, after many many games, I realised that if you destroyed the small white blobs, this caused the explosion. So this is yet another thing to keep an eye on. There's no distinct levels and the landscape doesn't change. There are also no meters on later levels. Again, probably for the best, considering the amount of things flying around the screen. All in all, a below average attempt, that not only has many of the arcade elements missing, but has terrible gameplay too. Next we have Cavern Fighter from Bugbite, released in 1983. This is a much more polished game than the previous one, with some nice scrolling and large colourful graphics. The landscape isn't solid though, like the arcade, but this can be forgiven because it scrolls really smoothly. The gameplay is nice too, if a little difficult. The ship has full movement, lasers and bombs, and a fuel gauge to keep an eye on. There are ground-based rockets to avoid, and there's also fuel pods that you need to shoot to keep your ship flying. The game has different levels, but they don't adhere to the arcade. The background and enemies change, and that's about it. We do get meteors in later levels though, but to be honest, you'd have to be a good player to get that far, something I really struggled with. As the game progresses, things speed up, making it very hard indeed. The cave roof becomes lower, giving you hardly any space to manoeuvre. One section changes the landscape from caves to square flashing blocks, presumably to mimic the arcade city level, but this just looks awful. It's like being in an 80s disco. And I think had it been a little easier, this game would have been a top contender. As it is, it's a competent version, and one that the others will have to beat. Next we have Ground Attack from Silversoft, released in 1982. This is the version that I bought, and to tell you the truth I was very disappointed with it. I knew I had to play it again for this shootout, and was interested to see if I felt the same way. My first impressions of the game were much better than I remembered them, despite the character-based scrolling. Not all the arcade elements are here though, and some of the levels that do don't replicate the arcade. For example, there are fuel pods, but there's no fuel limit, so destroying them just gives you points. Levels are limited to just two as well, the initial landscape, followed by the cave system. From then on, the cave just gets narrower, although the colour does change as you move further into them. There are no meteors, just flashing things. No idea what they are really, just shoot them anyway. Control can be a little bit sticky too, but not so much to detract from the gameplay, which is not bad once you get into it. The first couple of levels can be quite dull, but things soon begin to hot up. I actually enjoyed playing this game second time around, and managed to get further than I ever did before. A nice game then that drifts a little from the arcade, but still well worth a look. Next we have Galactic Gunners from Cybex Labs Software, released in 1987. This takes Scramble and adds a few extra twists, but there's no doubt that the game is based on the arcade favourite. The strangely shaped ship flies over smooth strolling landscape and is equipped with the usual lasers and bombs. Dropping bombs is tricky though, as there's no separate key to do it. What you have to do is hold down the fire button. This means, of course, you can't fire at the same time. It's not bad once you get used to it, but it often causes a delay in firing, which can lead to you missing your target. Control is crisp and responsive, and the game flows really nice. Sound is top notch with some great effects, and a nice little tune that helps things along. There's also bonus effects and explosions. Here's the first branch from the original. You collect bonuses that give you shields and power-ups, something certainly required for later levels. Talking of levels, this game has ten of them, all smoothly scrolling and nicely drawn, and a delight to play through. Enemies vary, and at the end of the level is a boss, again different from the arcade, but it does add an extra dimension. So 
Some may say this game with its power-ups and boss battles is not scramble, but in my opinion it's certainly pretty close, and the additions do provide varied and interesting gameplay. It takes the basic arcade, adds more variety, and the end result is a damn fine game. And this one's certainly a top contender. Next we have Hidden City, released in 1983 by Bytewell. I'm not really sure if this game should be included, as it doesn't really follow the arcade game at all. It has many differences, but some similarities. The first level you just fly across one screen and avoid the lasers. The next level you travel around a maze picking up fuel pods. And the third level takes us into a scramble-like gameplay. You fly through the caves and destroy the enemy base at the end. Having done this, however, you're just left flying across a flat landscape until your fuel runs out. Maybe I should have got more fuel, but I'm not sure. The game states that you have to get a certain score to win, but I couldn't see how to get that, and certainly played it enough times. I think the key is to collect all the fuel, shoot all of the enemies, and destroy all of the end of level bases. Anyway, this game is best left alone if you're looking for some serious scramble action. Next we have Kamikaze from J.K. Gray, released in 1982. Another very early game, and another character-based scrolling 8-pixel jumping shooter. The landscape judders past and we get the usual land-based rockets and fuel pods. Later levels introduce a roof to form a cave system, and flashing boxes that I think are supposed to be meteors. There's no horizontal movement on your ship either, just up and down, which limits survival. That, coupled with the restrictions on firing, means that most games are very short. When you fire, or drop a bomb, you can't fire again until your laser either hits something or reaches the end of the screen. This often causes you to crash into something that you're lining up to shoot, because your laser's still flying across the screen somewhere. Sound is minimalistic with horrendous sounds when you lose a life, and at this point the game stops for a few seconds while your ship is pasted back into position and the game continues. Absolutely awful. Gameplay is difficult because of all the limitations I've mentioned, and even playing it in slow mode, getting far is a challenge, and something that you probably wouldn't want to try again anyway. One to bypass, I think. Next we have Lunar Attack from KSoft, released in 1984. Now this game first appeared as a type-in in your computer called Bomb Alley, but because it was subsequently a commercial release, it gets a place in the tests. The game has some nice graphics, with dual-coloured landscapes that change per level. This makes it look really nice. It's a pity that the scrolling is jerky. Your ship looks like the arcade version and has full movement, with separate keys for bombs and lasers, although the key combinations are a little tricky to get used to. Ground-based missiles are nicely done, and the fuel pods have to be destroyed to keep your ship flying. Playing the game for ages didn't seem to get me into a cave system or city, but the landscape did change colour. There are meteors on later levels, but they move at the same speed as a landscape, meaning that you just have to avoid them rather than dodge them in the arcade. There are also bouncing aliens in later levels, although these are just green blobs. The game is well done for a type-in, but not sure it could be considered a good release for 1984. Having said that, it's much better than some of the other games we've looked at in this test. And now comes probably the best known game of our tests, Penetrator from Melbourne House, released in 1983. I don't know what I can say that hasn't already been said about this game. After the fireworks and siren, the game kicks off and we are treated to a damn fine shoot em up. The landscape is wireframe rather than solid, but scrolls smoothly enough. Your ship, which differs from the arcade slightly, still looks cool and handles really well, having full directional control. The forward key is also used for firing, which is slightly annoying, as you are continually stabbing the key to fire, and at the same time this moves your ship forward a few pixels. 
The firing and bombing work well apart from that, and the gameplay is spot on. The tune that plays between each life soon gets annoying though, and you just want to get back into some more blasting. The game has different levels with different colours. There's a normal landscape, two cave systems, and then the final city. There are ground-based missiles and bouncing aliens, but no meteors, sadly. There's also no fuel limit, the fuel pods being replaced by radar stations. The instructions claim that failing to destroy these will mean the missiles become more accurate, although I've no idea if this is true or not. This game also has another amazing feature, a level designer. You can build your own levels and save them to tape so your friends can play them. A great little addition that certainly extends the game's life, and something I spent ages messing about with when I first bought the game. A great game then, but one that still has a few things missing. Next comes Scramble from Crichton Force, released in 1984. Here, the spaceship of the arcade is replaced by a helicopter flying through caves, rather like the second stage of the arcade machine. The landscape judders by and the controls are very sluggish, often causing you to crash or hit an enemy item. The ground-based missiles in this version only appear after a good 15 minutes of playing, by which time you just want to stop anyway. There are ground-based pods to bomb and fuel dumps, Fuel is limited and can be replenished by bombing these, like the arcade machine. There are moving aliens too, to either shoot or avoid. And if you get far enough, you will see what I think are meteors, but they could be anything really. There's no horizontal player movement either, just up and down, which limits the gameplay and causes lots of frantic key pressing as you try to change direction to avoid the enemies. Sound is restricted to a standard machine code ZAP, found in practically all early arcade clones, and it even causes the game to pause while playing it. Not one to recommend then. And now on to another game also called Scramble, this time from Microgen, released in 1983. For an early Microgen game, it displays all the typical features character-based scrolling, and those all-too-familiar sound effects used by Microgen in most of their early games. That said, it's not a bad game, and includes many of the arcade elements. We get ground-based missiles that launch upwards, fuel pods and a fuel limit, and we even get four distinct levels. This is one of the few games that actually sends us to an underground city too. Controls are slightly different to the arcade, and instead of horizontal free movement, we get a thrust key. This sends a ship forwards, and releasing the key, it slowly moves back to the left hand side of the screen. This can take some getting used to. The ship is also continually dropping bombs, so no key press is required there. All you need to do is concentrate on firing. Control is responsive, and the game has several options for speed, and a starting level. This at least lets you see all the levels of the game, if you're a bad player. Sound is minimal, and as mentioned before, you get the usual microgen laser sounds, plus an explosion when you die, but that's about it. Not a bad game overall, and certainly worth trying. The next game is Spectrum Scramble, by Workforce, released in 1982. A really early attempt at an arcade game that just doesn't do anything right at all. Horrible graphics and colour scheme, jerky scrolling and awful keyboard layout. The missiles are replaced by large bullets firing diagonally. There is a fuel limit, but I couldn't quite figure out what you had to destroy to increase it. The stages seem to repeat several times before the next level kicks in. But on the plus side, there are bouncing aliens and meteors, although I wouldn't celebrate the fact. The scoreline flickers like crazy too, which is a real distraction at times. And I think you should leave this one well alone.
And now, finally, on to the last game of our test. And a much new one as well. This is Squamble, written by Jonathan Caldwell in 1993. I have very mixed feelings about this game. Yes, it has lovely large and well-animated graphics. Yes, the controls are responsive. Yes, there is a few limit missiles, meteors and bouncing aliens. And yes, there's even a city level. The sounds are good, as long as you run it on a 1 to 8K machine. But there's one thing that doesn't get a tick in the box, and that is playability. For me, it was far too difficult. I admit I'm not the best gamer, but can usually get to level 3 or 4 in the arcade machine. But not on this game. I struggle to get past the first level. This has large meteors flying across the screen that you can't destroy and you just have to avoid. And these meteors are present throughout the rest of the game, causing havoc especially in tight caves and narrow city spaces. A few less of these would have improved the gameplay no end. There are also added elements, like saving humans, which is a nice feature. But the game doesn't have an end, it just repeats. The only way I could get to see the rest of the game was to watch the RZX playback, which is playing now. If you're an above average gamer, then certainly give it a go, it's a good game. Sadly, I must be rubbish. Oh well. Right, that's it. Testing done. So, which of our games can claim to be the best Scramble clone? Before I name the game, or games, I must say that there isn't a full featured version on the Spectrum. Every game has something missing, but we have to go with whatever we have. The choice was very difficult, and between two games. One is close to the arcade, but for me the other one just plays so much better. So, if you want a game that nearly matches the arcade, then your choice is Penetrator from Melbourne House. If, however, you want a game that plays slightly differently, but is a really good game, go for Galactic Gunners by Cybex Lab Software. Both are great games for different reasons, and I know most Spectrum owners would have played Penetrator, so why not give Galactic Gunners a try and see what you think. Enduro Racer was an arcade hit from Sega, released in 1986. The cabinet had a sit-down motorbike that allowed you to experience the thrills of racing through various terrains, dodging other riders and jumping over them by using logs. The gameplay and 3D graphics were great, and home conversions soon began to arrive. With these kind of visuals to copy, how did the Spectrum version match up? The game itself came in a large box with an attractive cover design and the game came in two flavours, 48k and 128k, the only difference being sound. The 48k version just had the rattling sound of the engine, while the 128k version had a nicer engine sound and a very irritating tune that keeps repeating, and I still can't find out to turn it off. Both versions though have the same gameplay, which follows the arcade machine with log jumps, changing scenery, time limits and other riders. The game mechanics are slightly different to the arcade though, but players wouldn't notice them, unless like me, you've jumped straight from the arcade version to the Spectrum version in a few minutes. Graphics wise the Spectrum version looks really nice, and I prefer that style to the arcade strangely enough. They seem to be a little bit more defined. Things move along smoothly at a nice rate, and control is responsive, giving a great game experience. Difficulty is, in my opinion, slightly harder than the arcade, but in different ways. The arcade version was tricky during the jumps. You had to pull a wheelie just before you hit the log, so that you cleared the rocks on the other side. This is a little easier in the Spectrum version, but is more unforgiving in the corners, forcing you to slow down to avoid hitting the roadside obstacles. You also get more large rocks in stage 2 compared to the arcade, which causes the difficulty to increase, and it did become a little frustrating at times. 
the Spectrum version can also feel slightly sluggish, especially when you're accelerating after just being knocked off your bike. But I suppose this is to be expected. The machine doesn't have the dedicated hardware of the arcade, and in general the arcade machine is faster. This doesn't take anything away from the Spectrum version though, which is a great achievement and a great game. All of the arcade levels have been included, all of the animation and all of the gameplay. It's a cracking game for race fans. Not in 3D is a one of a kind game. Released in 1983 by New Generation Software, a company known for 3D games, the idea is simple and yet beautifully executed. Take light cycles, give the player a front seat view and turn the whole thing into a first person 3D game. You are given a choice of control and game speed at the start, before being thrown into an empty 3D world. The idea is to move around and avoid hitting anything. As you move, you leave a yellow green trail behind you. You have up to four chasers, who leave a red blue trail. You must not run into any trails and survive as long as possible. Initially the game area seems empty, but it soon fills up with trails and you have to swerve to avoid them. Soon the area becomes full of twisting, turning trails, and the whole thing becomes a hectic key stabbing marathon. Remember, you're in a 3D world, so travel in all planes is possible. For example, if you're approaching a trail, you can go left or right to avoid it, you can also go under or over it. Gameplay is good, with nice colours and smooth graphics that whiz by at a fair pace, with no colour clash. And it isn't long before you find yourself entangled in a mass of trails. I noticed that when moving up and down you don't actually turn and head off in that direction, you just move up and down in the playfield, but still continue to move in the same direction. Once you get used to that idea, the game makes more sense. Sound is used very sparingly, with just the sound when you hit another trail. Apart from that it's silence. Hitting a trail will give you a fault, as displayed in the panel at the bottom of the screen. Too many faults and the game ends. The game was written by Malcolm Evans, the man who wrote most of new generation's 3D games like 3D Tunnel, Escape, Corridors of Genon, and later the Trashman games. When I first played this in 1983, I was amazed at the 3D world and solid graphics. Today it's a little dated though, but it still provides a challenge, and you do get a feeling of relief when you emerge from a tangle of knots into open space, and excitement again when the trails start to appear in front of you. There's also a degree of wanting to try again just to get a little further each time, which is not a bad thing. It's not a game for everyone, but it only takes a few seconds to load up in an emulator, and it's interesting to see the 3D effect, so why not give it a try? F1 Tornado Simulator, released by Zeppelin Games in 1991, is not, as its name suggests, a flight simulator, but an out and out shoot 'em up. Ignore all the backstory of having to identify enemy positions and whatnot, just pick up your joystick and blast away. The mission is simple take off from an aircraft carrier, locate and destroy the enemy headquarters, and blow as much stuff up as possible on the way. For a budget release, this is a great little shooter, once you figure out how to select the power-ups. Initially you have just machine guns, but like most good shooters, destroying enemies can leave collectible power-ups. These range from reverse fire and double fire to missiles and bombs. Once collected, you can select them by pressing 0 or space if you are using a joystick. Each power-up lasts for a short period of time, indicated by a rather annoying beeper sound. The graphics are well drawn and smooth, and respond well to controls, which can be keyboard or joystick. 
Whichever method you use, you will still have to select the powers by using the keyboard though. The landscape is detailed and scrolls very smoothly, changing as you complete levels. The enemy comes in a variety of different forms. Planes, gun emplacements, ships, helicopters and tanks. And at the end of each level, there's a boss fight. These are fairly straightforward to beat, at least the first two are, unless, like me, you're only an average shoot 'em up player. But then again, it's not too difficult, and that's the secret of a good playable game. This has all the elements of a great game, but is sadly let down by one thing, the sound. The same effect is used pretty much for everything apart from collection and selection of power-ups, and there isn't even a firing sound. That said, this is still a great little shooter that should be tried by any fan of this type of game. Sinclair released three Horace games for the Spectrum, and they were love or hate type games. Personally I couldn't see the attraction, but there were plenty of people who did. In 1995 Horace made a return in Horace in the Mystic Woods, which was only released for the Science Series 3A Palm Top Glorified Calculator. In 2010 though, thanks to Bob Smith, the fourth Horace game finally came home to the Spectrum, and his conversion was made available free of charge. This incarnation sees our hero Horace lost in the mystic woods and trying to get home. There are 64 screens to get through, which involves collecting all the objects before heading for the exit, very much like Manic Miner. Unlike Manic Miner and many other platform games, however, is the movement of the main character. He now has inertia, which can very easily catch you out. Horace doesn't stop when you release the key or stop moving the joystick, he takes time to slow down. The longer you press the key, the faster he moves and the longer he takes to slow down. And this added feature makes the game a little tricky to master. There are collectible bonuses too, giving Horace invincibility or stopping enemies for a few seconds for example, so it's more than just a collect em up. The graphics are good and well defined and smooth, and capture the feel of the previous Horace games well. Control is good, although the inertia is tricky to get used to. Sound is good with some nice music and spot effects, and a terrible scream when Horace bites the dust. One good point about the game is, if you run out of lives you can continue from the last level you got to, which is a nice feature, and one I think that is needed in this game due to the difficulty level and number of screens. This also adds to the playability, as you're not forced to repeat already completed levels. The design of the screens are well thought out, and provide a solid challenge for platform fans. Overall then, a great conversion and a great game. Welcome home, Horace. Welcome to Type In Corner. This month's game is Star Swarm, that appeared in the May edition of Popular Computing Weekly. The listing was pretty short, and contained two machine code routines to generate sound, and this is what interested me in the first place. It also uses all 21 user-definable graphics. From memory the listing gave me no problems when I entered it, however after loading it up I noticed I'd changed some of the instruction screens. I quickly set everything back as per the original listing, and this is the result. 
The game is a standard alien shooting affair, but with added zest due to the sound effects. There are six types of aliens in groups of five. Individually they drop down from the top of the screen and you have to shoot them. Letting them pass loses you points, and crashing into them obviously kills you. Being in basic, the graphics are character based and move in 8 pixel jumps, but that's not a problem with this game. If you get past all of the aliens, you then move on to the star base where you have to face the mothership. Here, you just shoot the ship and carry on. For 1983, this typing stood out from other similar games in other magazines for several reasons. Firstly, the number of different aliens. There's a nice variety of types and colour. Secondly, the Starbase with nice wireframe graphics. Not many typings had different levels, let alone different graphic styles. Thirdly, the Mothership Encounter. Not many typings had these either. Fourthly, the sound effects. As mentioned before, the game uses two machine code routines to generate some nice sounds much better than the beep sounds you get in many typing games. And for those reasons alone, it's worth a look. Join us next month for another game in Typing Corner. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.